Hello everyone, so this is part three of our lecture series on uh, population genetics. This will be the last lecture and it'll be pretty short because I can feel that it's harder for me to make it through the presentation without coughing. So um, I want to talk a little bit uh, really quickly about the assumptions associated with um, a population that will stay in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So a population that stays in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium has a number of characteristics. <clears throat> One, there's no natural selection. Okay, so there is no one trait that is favorable in the population leading to um, its increase in frequency over another. There is no genetic drift. And genetic drift is essentially a random change due to a sampling effect. In other words, one allele doesn't just get lucky and is present in the population more than another. <clears throat> You have no new alleles added or taken away. Due to immigration, people coming in or organisms coming into the population or immigration individuals or alleles leaving the population. <clears throat> there are no new, no new alleles introduced into the population due to mutation. And finally, the last one is that um, uh, mating is completely random. In other words, individuals can't choose to mate based upon or don't choose to mate based upon a particular phenotype and genotype. Okay, So these are examples of uh, assumptions that have to be in effect <coughs> If the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, if for a population to stay in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, now we know that <clears throat> if those are assumptions for pop for that are necessary for a population to stay in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, we know it's a violation of one or more of those assumptions that causes a population to be out of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium and then therefore evolve. And one of those um, particular um, things that that causes a um, allele frequencies to change in a population is natural selection. And then what happens is <coughs> natural excuse me, natural selection increases the frequencies of certain alleles over time. And we've seen this in a number of cases. So for example, the increase in the frequency of drug resistant strains of tubercu of the tuberculosis bacterium, and um, the increase in frequency of the alleles that cause changes in beak shape and body size <coughs> in medium ground finches. So, so we know that, and we've seen other examples of this, and we're going to see other examples of this <clears throat> as we finish up the course. But we know that this is a, a pretty strong agent of change, and it is the agent of change that sort of consistently uh, results in adaptation. And we'll discuss the other mechanisms, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, that cause evolution when I see you guys. Probably if, if I don't do it on Thursday, we'll do it on, uh, on Tuesday of next week. So there are basically three ty different types of natural selection that can cause changes in a population and therefore cause cause a population to be out of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. 
One of those types is directional selection. In directional selection, if it continues over time, um, uh, it will sort of change the allele frequencies in one direction or another in a population. So for example, if we look at the cliff, cliff swallow example that's in your textbook, um, they talk about an original population of, of cliff swallows sort of the distribution of body class sizes in that original population. And then they talk about um, uh, a, an occurrence, a change in the environment that essentially changed the um, frequency of body class sizes in the population <clears throat> to one extreme. So in 1996, um, the environment in which cliff, cliff swallows, this population of cliff swallows uh, were surviving, there was a very, very cold, they had a very, very cold and rainy season. <clears throat> Birds, uh, cliff swallows feed on insects and insects sort of really disappeared due to the very cold and unusually rainy weather in 1996. As a result, um, almost 2,000 swallows died of starvation and the survivors um, that um, managed to make it through that cold and rainy season were bigger and they had larger fat stores that allowed them to survive during the cold. So if you look, here is the original population of individuals and the distribution of body class sizes. <clears throat> and then this is the distribution of body class sizes in the population of cliff swallows that survived the cold rainy weather. And so what you can see is that the mean body class size shifted in one direction, in this case to larger body class sizes, due to this particular change in the environment. Okay, So this is an example of directional selection. It led to a change in the average body size of these cliff swallows <clears throat> to the right, in this case, towards larger body class sizes. This is an example of directional selection. In other words, they, uh, you have a normal distribution of um, phenotypes and genotypes before a selective event. <clears throat> During selection, there's a higher fitness for individuals of a particular phenotype and genotype. And then after the selection event, what that does is it causes the average value of the trait in that next generation to be shifted in one direction or another. Okay, in this case, shifted to the right to increase body size. The change can also be a shift um, in the other direction as well. So those are, that's an example of directional selection. Another type of um, natural selection is stabilizing selection. <clears throat> And in stabilizing selection, what happens is, is an average value or the median value is the uh, highest fitness in a population. So if you look at a before selection event, you have a normal distribution. During selection, the individuals that have moderate phenotypes, which are coded for in their genotypes, have a higher fitness. And those at the extremes have a lower fitness causing an increase in the number of individuals that have the average value. <clears throat> in, a, in other words, there's sort of a reduction in variation in the population. There are fewer organisms living at each of the extremes. We've seen this happening in the percentage of newborns <clears throat> in hospitals. And that is that as you, <clears throat> as babies get smaller, excuse me, larger or smaller, their mortality rates get higher Babies that have an average birth weight, around seven, tend to survive more. And so what we have happening in the human population is we have a stabilizing selection happening such that the average birth weight um, is, or a moderate birth weight, is has the highest fitness. And those babies that have lower, higher or lower birth weights have lower fitness. <clears throat> so this is called stabilizing selection okay it's under pretty strong birth weight is under pretty strong stabilizing selection in human beings 
The last type of natural selection I want to talk about um, is disruptive selection. And what disruptive selection does is it eliminates phenotypes near the average value. It maintains genetic variation is particularly important to me um, in that it is often the mechanism that re results in speciation, that is the occurrence of new species. So they give in your textbook an example of um, in West Africa seed cracker birds and seed cracker birds, birds for some reason um, their food resources changed. <clears throat> There used to be a pretty even distribution of food resources in these seed cracker populations in Africa. And what happened was is that there was a, a, an event that led to um, an elimination of intermediate seed sizes <clears throat> available to seed crackers in general. Okay. So because there were no intermediate sized seeds, there are only small and large seeds. Um, only small and large seeds were available. What happened was was that you got uh, seed crackers that had large beaks or longer beaks that were able to um, crack big seeds and seed crackers that had smaller beaks that were actually better at cracking small seeds. Individuals that had intermediate beak lengths were actually not very good at cracking either very large or very small seeds and were at a significant disadvantage. So um, what has happened in this population is bef there were the distribution of beak sizes or beak lengths was pretty normal. For some reason, um, intermediate sized seeds in the population became rare. Um, a, causing individuals that have larger beads, beaks to be able to eat larger seeds and those with smaller beaks to eat smaller seeds, but those with intermediate beak sizes really not being able to eat either one of these very well. And so what you find is you found an increase in the extremes over time. This is an increase in variation. If this type of selection continued and that intermediate size seed um, source was permanently eliminated from this population, you would expect that this could lead to um, speciation. That is, that large beaked birds may only breed with large beaked birds and small beaked birds may only breed with small beaked birds, increasing survival, but also leading to a, a, a cessation in breeding between the two different phenotypes. And this is what can happen with disruptive selection. Okay, These guys eventually could become reproductively isolated and lead to new species. And we'll talk about that when we come back to speciation, a discussion of speciation in the next couple of weeks. All right, that's it, guys. <coughs> Review the topics of genetic drift and gene flow. Um, mutation um, in your and non-random mating in your textbook, but really focus on the materials that we've talked about here in these online uh, screencasts. And I'll see you guys on Thursday. Prepare for your quiz, guys, and I'll talk to you soon.